Hello and welcome to Landscape Livestream, an ongoing series where we spend our lunch hour talk, taking a shallow dive in everything related to laneway housing. Today I'll be joined by my colleague Tony Kuna. Tony is our senior manager at Landscape, and he's personally responsible for more laneway house designs and approvals than any other person in the history of Toronto. He and I are going to discuss our experiences and everything we've learned seeing the changing lanes policy be implemented and evolve. Before we get into that, uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, be sure to sign up for uh, Lanescape's Laneway Housing Workshop, which will be on June 24th in the evening. You can find a link to that on our website and social media. Our workshops are where we dive into designing and building laneway suites, and we'll actually take the time to help you see what's possible on your property. Also, next week's guest on Landscape Livestream will be Daniel Hall from TABC. Be sure to join us uh, this time on Thursday next week to discuss prefabrication and sustainability on laneways. Finally, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media so you can stay updated on all of our ongoing workshop and policy work. I'm going to bring in Tony here, coming at us live from one of Landscape's sites in the east end of Toronto. So we'll see where he's at, do a quick tour, and then get into the discussion. Hey, Tony. Hey, Craig. How's it going? Good. How about yourself? Good. You know, uh, it's uh, 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 out here on, uh, at our Seaton Village build. Uh, happy to show everybody around. And um, do you want to do that before we start the discussion? Sure. Can you give us a bit of a shot down the laneway so we can see how it fits into the context? For sure. So <clears throat> as you can see, just like any other laneway, <clears throat> this is uh, one of the first builds uh, that we'll be completing. Uh, this will be uh, 1,050 square foot, obviously two stories, uh, with an integrated garage on the ground floor and a pretty spacious one bedroom unit on the second floor. Great, that building across the laneway looks pretty tall. <laughs> yeah, uh, we didn't do this one. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's definitely an interesting context, but I mean, it's a, it's a great property, really close to community amenities, uh, footsteps from the Blue Subway. So uh, promises to be uh, quite a valuable asset, but also a pretty unique uh, living scenario. And does emergency access through this one through the side yard or the laneway? Yeah, great question. So actually, um, there's two ways to provide emergency access, of course. Uh, the first is via the laneway. Um, in this case, uh, the sort of critical threshold to meet is 45 meters from the street. In this case, it's Fallis Avenue ahead. Um, so we actually uh, located the entrance door to this sort of south side of the lot in order to be within that 45 meters. Um, if we were to locate the entrance door on the north side, for example, we would no longer uh, satisfy that requirement. Hmm. So there we go. Access <laughs> through the laneway. Is there any access to the rear yard here? Uh, there is. Uh, let me take a walk through and I'll show you guys the backyard. I recall the design for this one has a ground floor studio space that could be used either by the upstairs rental or by the main house and the rear yard. So it's got flexibility to be owner occupied or rented out, correct? Exactly right. So uh, in this case, uh, we're building for a um, uh, the homeowner's daughter. Uh, who will be moving into the one bedroom unit upstairs and the downstairs uh, that sorry the downstairs uh, is sort of the purpose there is obviously the garage but then having some sort of slush slush space that's sort of multifunction um, that could uh, function as part of the main house for the parents or to actually be an additional living space in the future right well thanks for joining us from site it's always nice to see one of these actually being put in context and, for sure uh, you know, when I was preparing for this, I, it kind of occurred to me that you're probably the architect with more laneway houses under your belt than any other architect in Toronto, um, which is a pretty cool accolade. So <coughs> I, it's kind of a two-part question for you to get us started. <coughs> the first is, uh, did you ever think that you'd have such an accolade at a young age? <laughs> the second is, do you realize how much you owe me and the other landscape partners for hiring you? <clears throat> uh, I think we lost Tony here. He was probably insulted by my question. I, I'm sorry? I lost you for a second there. Hopefully oh. it was still going on the stream. Oh, yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, 
the I mean for me personally it's uh it's really near and dear to my heart because it's uh I mean being a young guy it's very difficult to access the market um obviously we have a housing crisis in the city and uh that like not only am I uh, building really cool buildings but also uh, uh sort of uh, making a social change as well um for people not dissimilar to myself uh in response to your second question, um, <clears throat> uh, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it, like we all work incredibly hard to make this work, uh, and you guys laid laid a great framework for us to to sort of apply this to. And um, we're looking forward to building a lot more. Darn right. Mm -hmm. So let's. Uh, I kind of want to dive into everything we've learned. I mean, uh, you were part of Landscape, sort of in the twilight of actually lobbying for and implementing the policy. Mm -hmm. And you've been here ever since it was actually enacted. So you've been one of the first people to apply for my housing approvals, um, as well as one of the most recent. Mm -hmm. We've seen quite a lot of evolution in the policy in that time. Um, so let's dive into that a little bit. Most sure. specifically, what's been a really hot button issue has been providing access for laneway houses. Mm -hmm. um, it's obvious that we need to keep our laneway residents safe, and that means uh, allowing fire and ambulance and police easy access to our laneway structures. Um, so, you've reviewed a lot of properties in Toronto. Mm -hmm. How are you finding most lots are able to deal with it, and are they able to deal with it? Yeah, I mean, uh, since we first started doing this uh, in fall of 2018, we've reviewed uh, close to 1,200 properties um, and with varying degrees of success. Uh, the uh, I would say if you were to really put a number to it, uh, a good two-thirds of those properties do satisfy the access requirements in one way or another, um, uh, with a third of them sort of being... Uh, that's sort of a unique scenario where you're sort of you have limited access on both sides of the house and you're sort of mid block um, so unfortunately with the current policy uh, they would not qualify um, but again with sort of recent developments uh, and agreements made available from uh, made available from the city uh, we're finding that quite a few more properties are eligible yeah well and one thing I think we've learned is that it's n not always as simple as just you've got the access guaranteed. Often you'll have to sign an agreement with your neighbor, um, which can be a bit of a challenge, or in some cases, like remove a bay window on the side of your house mm -hmm. or something like that. How are those in terms of how difficult they are to overcome versus the upside of the project in the end? Yeah, for sure. So just sort of taking a step back, uh, in December, uh, the city released an agreement uh, called the LDA or the Limiting Distance Agreement. And what that basically does is that it allows two neighbors to share the space between their houses for a mutual access route accessing the rear yard, which ultimately is a linchpin in uh, both lots being eligible to build a laneway suite. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that, of course, has unlocked quite a few more eligible properties. Uh, the key thing there is making sure that uh, both neighbors are well educated on the implications of the agreement and just making sure that we have an open dialogue along the way. Um, there's always questions about how that agreement will impact resale value and uh, sort of do I have to move my AC unit type thing, um, <clears throat> which are easily navigated and in nearly all cases uh, we come to some sort of agreement one way or another. Yeah, uh, I know I've actually had one of my laneway projects just get stopped because the client needs a limiting distance access uh, agreement with the neighbor, and they just outright refuse. Right. Uh, so in some cases, we kind of need to prepare our clients to uh, be fairly flexible with their neighbors and like essentially offer to pay them money in exchange for that access, even though it can benefit both sides, which uh, certainly does not go over well with people, but I always mm -hmm. like to remind them getting a second house on your property free of development charges like whatever that's going to cost you yeah. whatever trouble you have to overcome there it's definitely worth it in the long run exactly and i mean just to elaborate on that i mean uh 90 of the time uh, i completely understand um sort of the, the first uh, level of discomfort when being presented with an agreement like this um but i mean uh, all it is is a matter of getting the appropriate and the right answers uh that like to address your questions um there's a lot of legalese in that document so it can be a little overwhelming at first but once you look at the data, um, it's kind of a no-brainer good thing we're here to help our clients navigate that right yep and by we i mean you 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's, I've become a pretty good negotiator over my <laughs> course of the last uh, 18 months, that's for sure. Well, and the, the one thing that's on the horizon that I think is most exciting is the requirement so that we can start to unlock deeper lots and lots that are farther down the laneway. So you said the, the limiting distance requirement from the curb to the front door of the laneway house is 45 meters currently. We're expecting that to get increased. I mean, we were expect expecting it to happen already, but COVID-19 has caused delays at City Hall. So when that comes through, that's really going to make an impact. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let's talk about Committee of Adjustment. Um, okay. We've seen some pretty outlandish projects go to committee. Um, in our office, we haven't gone very many times. Do you know how many times we've gone to committee? Uh, we have uh, two approvals and we have another three in the works. Yeah. And why, like, so we generally don't go to committee of adjustment for language houses and we try to discourage everyone from doing it. Like, it's basically a huge waste of uh, time and money usually for very little gain. So in the cases when we go, what are the reasons we use to actually convince ourselves to go get minor variances? Yeah, I mean, I would say um, uh, we tend to refrain from going to Committee of Adjustment unless there's a unique existing circumstance that really uh, that, that's really worth it. Um, the, the great paradox with Committee is um, in order to have a successful application, you can't ask for much. Um, and then at that point, uh, you're for a minor gain, um, weighing that against how much investment and time and money, of course, um, is that really worth that minor gain? Um, <clears throat> so the, the scenarios that we've applied for are sort of things like retaining existing structures. Um, for example, we have one in, uh, on Humewood that uh, is a large existing ground floor uh or sorry single story garage that we're proposing a second story addition to um and i mean no matter what we did the existing building would not comply with the max width or depth requirements um so things of that nature generally uh we always want to make sure that um, we assess all the possible options outside of committee and then make a critical decision at that point early in the process yeah in my kind of review of the laneway houses that have been going to committee I find most applications make a lot of sense when they're legalizing an existing structure, uh, but then anything new otherwise conforms to the bylaws. Those kind of warm my heart as an architect because that's what committee is for. It's for making an unusual existing circumstance fit into the bylaws. Um, but we've seen a lot of people go just because they want extra height or extra density, and that kind of pisses me off because <laughs> it's yeah. just greed. Like it's, There's no planning rationale behind it. What's your yeah. reaction been to that? I mean, yeah, exactly the same. It's like, like let, let's be clear. The, the laneway suite bylaws are very flexible. Um, if you have a good architect and a good design team with experience, um, you can, I mean, you can do virtually anything. Um, the, and I, a common misconception is that laneway houses are tiny homes. Uh, like we have some builds that approach 1,700 square feet. Um, and when you add to a basement, uh, when you add a basement to that, you have nearly 2,600 square feet of usable area in a laneway house. Um, so, I mean, uh, going for additional density or additional height, I mean, may be worth it depending on the context and the situation. Um, but the vast majority of properties, I don't recommend it. We just had a good comment in the chat here. Someone's asking if we've ever gotten a minor variance for the emergency access travel distance. That's not a zoning requirement, right? Like that's building code. You can't get a variance for that. Exactly right. So, um, I mean, uh, so the municipality dictates uh, sort of size, shape, and location of buildings through their through the zoning bylaws. Um, whereas the emergency access requirements are a code item, uh, which are reviewed at the permitting stage. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, the access requirements aren't in the purview of Committee of Adjustment. But someone has kind of gotten the variance for it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you want to muddy the water. Um, so, uh, yeah, last year, um, a homeowner uh, that, was, uh, uh, that could not satisfy the access requirements, uh, they actually made an appeal to the Building Code Commission. Um, the appeal was ultimately successful, but uh, the key thing there is just knowing that um, so I'm getting some wind. Uh, the key thing there is just knowing that it's a very project-specific approval. Um, it's not an overarching policy change that would apply to other projects. Um, and it's quite an investment. So uh, if you're a homeowner that would be interested in pursuing that, I mean, prepare yourself for several months of sort of 
supported by the city. And we have several thousand dollars in sort of uh, application fees and uh, consulting fees. We're getting a lot of wind. Can you find a sheltered spot yeah, there? I can go inside. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I mean, we talked about how a committee of adjustment takes a long time and costs a lot of money. Building code commission <laughs> appeals take even longer and cost even more. Uh, mm -hmm. and are even more uncertain when it comes to the outcome. So uh, definitely not something worth exploring right now, right? I mean, our, our uh, guidance to our clients is to basically just be patient and wait for the city to increase the travel distance, which we're expecting to happen hopefully in the next few months, rather exactly. than trying to fight that fight. Yep. All right, and one thing that has been a real hot button uh, for our office has been dormers. So <laughs> give us a quick rundown of what the dormer allowance is for laneway houses with respect mm -hmm. to angular plane requirements. Yeah, so uh, on lots where you sort of have a sort of a shallow rear yard, um, you're required to conform to what's called the angular plane requirements. It's, it's essentially, um, uh, it's a fictional plane drawn four meters up and uh, 45 degrees toward the rear lot line. Um, now, your building is per permitted to project through that angular plane with a dormer. Uh, for those of you that don't know the term, a dormer is basically uh, an enclosed uh, 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 window box that projects out of an angular roof line. Um, now, that dormer cannot exceed 30% of the uh, building width at the rear yard. So, I mean, uh, we'll typically try to uh, locate that in areas to sort of frame views and preserve privacy to the main house um, and to the rear yard, of course. Now, so, yeah, the issue we've been having is there's an angular plane that basically dictates the second floor it has to be angled away from the main house when mm -hmm. you're in a tight backyard situation. Mm -hmm. With the exception of that dormer, and that's allowed to be a certain width of the house, but where it's located is not clearly defined. So in a few applications, we push it right off to the edge of the house. And the city has basically refused our application for un really unknown and undefined reasons in the bylaws. Uh, so we're having to move those dormers away from the side walls. We're not really sure what the amount's going to be. It's looking like four inches from the side wall will, might be acceptable, but we're not really sure why. What are you telling our clients who are in that circumstance where they want a dormer right up flush with the sidewall? What do they have to do to get the approval and move on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, first of all, it's a matter of making sure that um, we're getting a zoning review right up front and making sure that uh, we have a zoning certificate uh, in place, basically a green light confirming our conformance before we move any further forward in the project. It's typically the first or second step in our process. Um, and then, uh, I mean, those, when, haven't, those haven't always worked, though. We've gotten clean zoning reviews, and then they've come back later to say our goal yeah. is incorrect. So it's kind of a new interpretation that's undefined. Mm -hmm. so exactly. What are, we, what are we doing to be uh, cautious against that, I guess? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, we're always applying pressure. Um, and uh, <laughs> we're always looking at all the resources available to see what's enforceable and what's pure interpretation. I mean, uh, it's obviously pretty difficult to uh, satisfy arbitrary requirements that aren't codified in any way, shape or form. Um, so for us, uh, our approach is always uh, make sure uh, that we're designing something that obviously is going to be accepted. Um, but at the same time, sort of educate the homeowner of the uh, sort of the gray areas in the body law uh, before we move forward and make sure that we have a, con a contingency plan in place if it does trigger a variance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, and of course, we never take these things lying down. So we're working mm -hmm. with the city to try to get them to define this in a way where there aren't going to be any surprises with dormer locations in the future. Hopefully, that will come to light soon. Exactly. Now, the project you're on actually doesn't have a second floor step in. Can you maybe go back to the rear yeah. yard and show us one more time so we can talk about why this project doesn't have it? Yep. So while you do that, someone in the chat, um, Elliot, was asking about uh, GFA and how it relates to the main house. There's no GFA restriction between the main house and the lame house. Your main house could be way above the allowable GFA, and it's totally unrelated to the lame house, correct? Exactly right. Uh, so the nice thing about the laneway suite policy is that your GFA for, of the laneway suite is exempt from your FSI calculation, your floor space index. Um, and it's also exempt from your lot coverage restriction. Uh, so long as the laneway suite does not ex uh, exceed 30% of the lot area, which in 99% of the cases it does, or it, it, it falls within, sorry. Right. Um, yeah. 
just another reason why lane, the lane rehousing poli- policy uh, provides. I mean, it's it's density that you wouldn't find elsewhere. I mean, it, it's a very very innovative policy. No GFA requirement, no development charges. It's almost too good to be true. And no vehicular parking requirements. And I mean, uh, there's a bunch of other things that sort of incentivize the entire process uh, that are very unique uh, to this typology. Yeah, thanks for the question, Elliot. So, great shot of this house. Uh, we were just explaining how normally the second requires an angular plane setback, but we don't have it here. So, why is that the case? Right, so uh, if you didn't notice uh, from the laneway side, uh, the, the roof is actually at a slight slope, uh, tapering toward the rear yard. And we sort of, uh, here we sort of worked with the homeowners to strategically plan uh, the outdoor space in addition to the indoor space. I mean, a lot of people that we work with um, uh, have, there's, they have a, a lot of value in their rear yard and they don't, I apologize, uh, my bad there. <laughs> so, um, no, they don't want to compromise the gardens. Uh, so here, we actually did not build to the maximum permitted area. I'm going to move inside. Um, what we ended up doing was we sort of strategically brought the building just enough into the rear yard where we sort of tapered the roof line down at a point where it intersected with the angular plane. Um, <clears throat> and we the pinch point at the second floor, which I'll show you in a bit, uh, is sort of like that about seven, seven and a half feet. And then it sort of tapers upward to a nine foot ceiling toward the laneway. So the angular plane is tied to the main house but the allowable footprint is flexible on the lot. So if you move the footprint beyond the angular plane, you can build a full two stories with no step in on the second floor, as mm-hmm. long as you're far enough away from the main house, correct? Exactly right. And it, again, it's just a matter of looking at all the scenarios from the outset and sort of strategically planning the, the lot in its, entire, in, in its entirety. I mean, uh, the laneway suite, uh, you can't design that in a vacuum. You're not going to meet your project goals when you look at it from the, from the inside out, right? Yeah, great. So, Tony, you and your team are learning a lot about the actual implementation of bylaws, things like the unwritten dormer rules. How can the people reading or listening to this find out all the things we're learning as we go? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, first and foremost, uh, of course, we publish everything that we do. Um, I don't pretend to know everything. Uh, we learn something new on every project, and as long as we sort of take that forward, that's our entire mandate. Um, the, uh, I suggest um, uh, use free information. Uh, every architect, uh, every builder in the city will provide free quotes. Um, they often do free feasibility studies. Um, for example, we do free property reviews with no site visit required. We typically can turn those around within a couple hours. Um, and then also just sort of refer to the website. Uh, we have uh, quite a bit of content, uh, both uh, written and video. Um, that sort of really accurately describe the forces at play and, um, and do, it, do so in sort of simple terms and diagrams. Great. I think we need to write a blog post about the dormer situation. It's a lot easier to describe with diagrams than it is just talking. Yeah, yeah, and I only have two hands, so I can't really. <laughs> yeah, well, in any case, put that on your to-do list, will you? I know you're not. <laughs> no, I mean, we, it's, we're just putting along here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, thanks very much for the tour, Tony, and uh, mm-hmm. anyone listening, of course, feel free to reach out to Landscape if you have questions about anything you heard here or your own projects. Uh, Tony would be happy to answer them. Uh, mm-hmm. Tune in next week where we're going to talk to Daniel Hall from TABC. Uh, he's one of the leaders in Toronto for sustainable design and prefabrication, and we want to pick his brain on basically ideas we can steal to make our own projects more sustainable. That'll be Thursday at noon. Um, and of course, be sure to follow Landscape uh, on our social media, and you can subscribe to our newsletter on our website for more information on dormant requirements and all the evolving requirements of the policy that we're digging into. Thanks for tuning in, and have a good week. We'll see you in the laneways.